All right, welcome everybody um, to this panel on new challenges for electoral officials. Uh, I'm David Kimball at the University of Missouri St. Louis. Uh, we've got five um, presentations here today, and then um, uh, each presenter will have 10 to 15 minutes. Then we've uh, got discussion um, from Joseph Call at the College of Worcester, um, and then we'll have Q&A. After that, uh, you can post questions in the chat, and when we get to the Q&A section, you can also uh, raise your hand and we'll call on you. Uh, so first up, um, is uh, Better Poll Workers, Better Performance uh, from Daniel Hellman of Martin Luther University. Daniel, go ahead. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, first of all, um, good evening and uh, greetings from Germany. Um, my name is Daniel Hellmann. I'm a research associate at the Institute for Parliamentary Research in Berlin and at the Martin Luther University in Halle. And um, I'm doing my PhD on electoral management in Germany. And for the sake of this research, I um, conducted an online survey uh, last year on which this paper is based. I will uh, talk about the data, uh, the data later. Um, but first of all, I want to present you the basic uh, research question, the idea this paper is founded on. So this is really the, the baseline. Um, the basic thought is rather simple. Um, I, th uh, I assume that the way poll workers are prepared for their for their job um, informs or um, is somehow linked to the way they perform in their jobs. So um, when we talk about preparation, um, there are several things that could um, include this preparation. So how are poll workers recruited? Um, are there problems in recruitment? Um, are there different channels of recruitment? Um, how are the poll workers trained? So different methods of training poll workers um, may inform their performance on election day. Um, how are poll workers assembled together in groups? Um, so how is the, uh, the group composition of uh, poll worker teams? And yeah, in the end, uh, it all informs how do poll worker teams perform on election day? How, they, how do they handle um, problems that come up? And um, I'm focusing on the case of Germany. Um, First, the honest answer is because I'm already researching Germany and I have data on uh, the German case. But um, apart from that, it's an interesting case, um, not that, not least because there was in the latest federal election in 2021, there are major issues in the uh, city state of Berlin um, where there were several problems related to poll workers, not um, not not, owned, not not isolated to poll workers, but um, related to poll workers. And so it at least um, opens up the research gap to look into what currently is going on with poll worker recruitment in Germany. Um, what we know by law is um, poll workers are volunteers, as are in, uh, as far as I know, most um, uh, most democracies around the world. Um, there's a low compensation, the so-called Erfrischungsgeld of um, at the last election was around 25 euros. Um, and um, the law stipulates that recruitment is re common recruitment channels are either parties or the uh, public administration. And we have uh, two studies on Germany in this case, uh, on this matter. That this is the one is from Reuning and Gerus in uh, 2011, and they conclude or assume that um, the party dominance in the state could increase the chances of fraud because the major parties could uh, control the poll worker recruit recruitment. And in 2019, Gerus and Funk um, assumed that the use of established poll worker teams, um, so using the, uh, the same teams uh, on different elections again and again, um, correlates with an increase of invalid votes. Um, they do not say whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. They just say, OK, there seems to be a, correla a correlation here. Um, and what uh, we can infer from related research um, First and foremost, there is a relationship, um, or it is um, it is reasonable to assume that there is a relationship between the quality of volunteers and the frequency of um, electoral errors or their performance on election day. 
Um, um, for example, see uh, James uh, 2019 with the much better title for his p uh, paper, um, um, for which I'm, uh, I envy him, um, better poll workers, better elections, um, which I would have liked to use for, for this paper, but it was already uh, given. Um, another thing we can infer is um, that the recruitment practices differ from country to country. For example, uh, a recent study from Prater Müller et al. in 2022 um, showed that parties play a major role in poll worker recruitment in Austria. And as I will uh, show on uh, show later on, um, this is not the case for Germany. Um, uh, as I already said, Gerus and Funk um, um, assumed that poll worker team composition can matter uh, in some way for their performance on election day. And um, I think this is um, not that controversial, but better training is related to better perf uh, performance. And the question is, what is good training for electoral um, for, for poll workers? So uh, which data can we use for the German case? Um, I did a or we did a survey um, asking all the returning officers, so the highest ranking electoral officials in the districts um, about um, the occurrences around the election day, about their way of approaching um, electoral administration for the federal election in 2021. Um, here you see the dark spots are the districts who um, we applied to our and we have a rather high response rate of 66.8 percent um but as you will see later on um, there are many respondents or so there were a few respondents who did not answer all questions uh, questions so our um so the the number of cases we can use for uh, more um in-depth research and analysis is rather limited um so some um, findings. Um, first finding is uh, concerns recruitment. Um, uh, only one fourth of the of the uh, respondents, so one fourth of the districts, uh, more or less, um, said they had no problems gathering gathering enough volunteers for uh, for the poll worker for the election day. Um, which means that um, seventy-five percent uh, had some problems uh, or uh, major problems in all uh, municipalities in the district, um, which is in line with research from from the U.S., um, where we also see high numbers of um, um, poll, uh, polling stations who say we have problems uh, gathering enough people. Um, parties, as I already already said, um, here on the you see the the um, red bars um, are rather un unimportant for um, for poll worker recruitment, um, and we see that the most um, important uh, two channels are either um, employees of the public administration here in yellow. Or um, the or volunteers who just um, come up and say, "Hey, I want to be in your volunteer pool, and I would like to volunteer as a poll worker on the next election." Uh, this is the the blue bar over here. So um, those 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 two recruitment channels are a little bit um, are, are trade offs. Um, so in districts where there were no problems um, getting uh, or gathering enough uh, poll workers, there were less people or less employees of the administration in the poll worker teams and vice versa for uh, for districts where there were there were problems and um, uh, uh, respectively less volunteers showing up. So um, the gaps in, uh, the, in in the poll worker teams are uh, often filled by the employees of the state. So uh, talking about uh, team composition, um, we have more or less two groups of um, of things the uh, the electoral administration can consider for a, a poll worker team composition. Um, first, I would say uh, I would call uh, the first group I would like to call um, experience based. So um, the team of poll workers includes uh, both experienced and new election workers and poll worker teams who have worked together in previous elections work together again. You see um, 
here on the right side, um, most uh, respondents said this is either very important or, uh, or important. Um, and we have on the other side more uh, team compos composition criteria that are more related to um, socio-demographic features, so to um, different age groups, different educa educational groups, different um, Gen or balanced gender ratio, and you see those are um, for most respondents either um, rather un unimportant or not important at all. Um, so you see the most uh, most um, electoral administrations place more significance on the experience than on the uh, socio demographic features of the poll worker teams. Um, and finally, about training. We have. Uh, I, I have to add that um, training is different uh, depending on which role you play in the poll worker team, um, because there are um, the election chairman, the deputy, and the, uh, the secretary who most often get more advanced training because they have a leading role in the respective poll worker team, and um, yeah. Uh, this is this often differs from the training that is offered to all um, to all um, poll workers. So you see here the online training is um, more or less uh, offered in a uh, is not offered at all in around a third of the cases, and the most um, the the most often used so vice versa. Um, training method is just sending out training materials, which I, uh, from my own personal experience, can uh, confirm. Um, it, all the time I so far have used, uh, I have been poll, a poll worker, I just received a small letter with instructions. I had more or less to read on my own, so not that much training, not, not that much um, time investment from my side. Um, and if you look who, what is offered to the uh, election chairman, the deputy and the secretary, you see those are more time intensive training methods, presence training, um, uh, practical exercises are often at least offered to those persons. And um, yeah, as I always already said, um, uh, just sending out training materials is the most often used um, yeah, option for just preparing poll workers. So what can go wrong on election day? Um, I, we asked the, the uh, returning officers a long list of possible problems that could come up on election day and asked them how often this th those problems came up. Um, you see here the dark blue spots, uh, bars are the very often, um, the light blue is often. The, the light uh, red is rare, the dark red is very rare, and here the overwhelming majority is um, of the black bars is never. So um, just a few things come up, uh, came up during um, the federal election 2021 on a broader scale. Um, for example, that poll workers did not show up on election day or that uh, queues, uh, queues have formed uh, outside polling stations. Um, this came up some amount of time, but not that often. So um, from those variables, I built an index variable um, to run a regression model. Um, you see the, uh, the results over here on the right side. Um, and uh, the, the most, um, I think, interesting findings are, first of all, that uh, the recruitment channels do not, the, uh, do not affect the frequency of problems that come up on election day. Um, then second, we see that uh, more time intensive training options increase the performance. This is, I think, also not this, uh, this surprising. Um, here you see that presence training increased um, the, or training in presence, so most likely um, listening to a presentation increased um, or decreased the chances of um, problems occurring on election day and just sending out training materials to all uh, poll workers um, did uh, increase the problems uh, that come, uh, came up on election day. And um, a thing I just I, I uh, up until now uh, up until now um, I have no real explanation for that um, 
for one the uh, a balanced um gender no not not the balanced gender but um here the the uh, that education is seen as important in the team composition seems to be related to less um or to more electoral uh, electoral problems so to wrap it up uh, wrap it up um we need more research i have um I, I ran into a few problems uh, during the research, and um, we for sure need further research. Research, um, so we need to know who are actually the poll workers in Germany. Um, are there socioeconomic features that determine the recruitment, training, uh, uh, composition, and uh, then uh, consequently the performance of uh, of of poll workers? But I'm out of time, I think. So thank you for your attention. And yeah, I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Um, next up, we have uh, Laurel Harbage-Young of Northwestern University uh, presenting research on incivility, slurs, threats, and violence against election, elected officials. How does the public respond? All right. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so thank you so much for the opportunity to talk today. Um, so this is a project joint with Alexander Falindra at the University of Illinois, Chicago. And I just wanted to flag that we appreciate feedback we got in an earlier draft of this work um, through the Electoral Integrity Project Fellows meeting, and we look forward to your feedback today. So I want to start with just a little bit of motivation here for thinking about this project, which is that when Democratic um, Mayor Jenny Durkin uh, was mayor of Seattle, she received a variety of threats and harassment, both from the far left of her own party, as well as from the right. And one round of messages that were left on the ground by protesters outside of her home said things like, Jenny is a Nazi, we will avenge you, Durkin, and also drew pictures of male genitalia and profanity. In another instance, uh, Solomon Pena in New Mexico ran unsuccessfully for a state house seat in 2022, and was later charged as masterminding shootings outside the homes of several Democratic legislators. And these two examples are part of a broader trend of behavior targeting elected officials, staff, and election workers that ranges from uncivil behavior to slurs about race or gender to threats to outright violence. And our broader research project that we're working on examine these trends from a multi multiple different angles, including how they affect the elect elected officials and staff. So thinking about dimensions of representation, career happiness, and trajectory, basically whether people are staying in office or leaving, as well as how the public responds. And so, you know, when we think about, so as I said, the kind of broader project is thinking about this, both from the perspective of elected officials, as, also, as well as kind of how the public is responding to this behavior. Um, and so this part of the project is focusing on the public response. So thinking about um, how the public responds to incidents of threats and violence and how that might be shaped by um, the partisanship involved. And this was motivated because the elected officials that we talked to in interviews kind of had this concern that as the public learned more about these threats and violence, their responses would be shaped by their partisanship and it actually may worsen uh, the problem facing elected officials. So our research for this project grows on a kind of increasing body of scholarship that is pointed to worrisome trends um, about growing harassment, threats and violence against elected officials, staff, as well as other civil servants. And this includes work by the U.S. Capitol Police, the National League of Cities, and the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the Bridging Divides Initiative work, as well as some academic surveys of mayors and other elected officials. We've also conducted over 100 different qualitative interviews with state and local officials in the U.S. And so our re research is drawing on a number of different theoretical perspectives that examine um, incivility and violence, how the public responds to leaders who violate democratic norms, how partisanship and partisan social identities might shape reactions to threats, and how the public re responds to incidents that involve in-group versus out-group members. And I'll circle back to some of our specific hypotheses in a few minutes. But I first wanna talk about um, a pilot study that we did on this research, where we wanted to first understand whether the public differentiates between incivility, slurs, threats of harm and actual violence when they're described in a nonpartisan manner. So that is when we don't know the partisanship of the elected official, 
or we don't know the partisanship of the constituents engaging in this behavior. So for this survey, uh, we ran a study with 500 respondents and throughout a longer survey that included um, questions about their partisan social identity and other things, we randomized 40 different incidents um, or kind of blocks of incidents that were asked about elected officials and the public. And for each incident, we asked respondents to list which words describe the behavior, civil, appropriate, uncivil, inappropriate, violent, and criminal. And in this work, um, we included a number of different incidents that we thought a priori were civil, then several that we thought were uncivil, were slurs, were threats, or were violence. And so here's an example of each of these. So the civil <clears throat> um, comment was something saying that someone disagreed with them, but just saying that their thinking is flawed on it. The uncivil examples uh, went to kind of language of like that you're worthless or used um, kind of obscene language. Um, the slurs um, were things that targeted the um, officials' gender, their race, or their religion. Um, the threats included both kind of implicit threats as well as explicit th threats. And then the violent incidents included both violence against property as well as direct violence against people, as the example here shows. So we used both factor analysis as well as simple um, just looking at mean scores on these different measures. Um, and so we looked at kind of three different indices. So the first index is a mean of how often people selected the term civil or appropriate. The second is selecting uncivil or inappropriate. And the third is selecting violent or criminal. And there are a couple of things that, that we took away from this initial analysis. First, people differentiate, differentiate civil interactions from other interactions. So the civil items are the highest scoring on the civil or appropriate index here. Second, people view uncivil incidents and slurs similarly. So these two tended to move together. Third, people viewed both threats and violence as different from mere incivility, but also differentiate threats from violence. We also separated our analyses by party, and we found that uh, this yielded very similar patterns. So Democrats and Republicans viewed these incidents very similarly in terms of how they placed them. However, where there was an important difference is in how people who were weak versus strong in their strength of partisan identity responded. So overall, the same trends that we saw in terms of people differentiating um, civil from other items, putting um, uncivil and slurs together and differentiating threats and violence, that held among both groups here. But what was striking um, in terms of the difference is that people who are strong um, in their strength of partisan identification um, were less likely to select the uncivil or inappropriate as, as descriptors, as well as violent or criminal, which seems to suggest that they viewed these incidents as perhaps less worrisome, less concerning, less seriousness than people with weak attachments. And so this is seen in the fact that the scores for the same incidents are higher on the uncivil and inappropriate and the violent and criminal indices here um, for those with weak attachments relative to those with strong attachments. So the next step of our project is to then assess how the partisanship of the politician and the constituents shape reactions. And for this, we've designed the full experiment um, and we've actually even pre-registered our initial version of it. But instead of running it in the weeks right before we were submitting this paper, we opted to hold off in case there was any feedback we got here that um, led us to kind of make any changes to this before we spent the money on the survey itself. So the survey includes four um, interactions. So we have a civil town hall, and this serves as a neutral control, a civil protest, where the idea here is that it's a protest, but it's civil in nature. So on the one hand, this is a democratic behavior, which should be seen positively. On the other hand, we might worry that in today's political environment, people view any sort of protest as perhaps more worrisome or more threatening. Um, and so we'll look at kind of whether this fits really as part of a control versus the first level of seriousness. Then we have the kind of two more serious conditions as we design them, where it's a protest where someone makes a threat towards the legislator and a protest where someone hits the legislator. <clears throat> and in all cases, we randomize whether the legislator is in the same party or the opposing party as the respondent. And constituents are then always from the opposite party as the legislator. And we'll be surveying just partisans, not independents. And then we measure um, how people describe the incident several measures of partisan animosity, for instance, feeling thermometers, 
questions that tap into meta perceptions. So that is, what do people think that those in the opposing party think about their group? Um, questions that tap into whether people rationalize violence, so whether they blame the victim, whether they think that circumstances can justify violence, whether this has just become politics as usual, and also a battery that taps into violent radicalization. And we hypothesize that whether threats or violence target an in-group politician and are conducted by the out party or target an out party politician and are conducted by the in-group are going to be evaluated differently. And our ultimate expectations get a little bit complicated, so I just want to highlight a couple of them here. So first, focusing on the top half of the figure, so if the threats are violent are directed toward an in-party politician, so someone in your own group and are by um, constituents in the out group, um, then we would expect that this should lead to increased partisan animosity, more negative meta perceptions about the opposing party, and increased violent radicalization. Um, we expect it to have a negative effect on people's willingness to rationalize violence since it's employed by the out party, and also that these effects should be stronger for violence rather than for threats. Um, so kind of a, an increase in seriousness here. By contrast, if we look at the bottom part here, we think this actually be quite different if it's people from your own group engaging in the kind of misbehavior and targeting someone from the other party. In this case, we actually think that it'll lead people to rationalize violence but we don't think that it'll have effects on partisan animosity or meta perceptions. And ultimately that it could be either a kind of negative or null perspective from the theory on violent radicalization. And here again, um, when we think about kind of the seriousness, the existing literature leads us to think that this won't be a linear increase, that people will be more willing to rationalize threats than they will outright violence. So to wrap up then, um, kind of where we're at with the project, we see so far that people can recognize um, kind of these distinctions between behaviors when it's nonpartisan in nature, uh, but that there is some kind of distinction here between weak and strong partisans. And that our next goal is to kind of test this theory about how um, this will differ when people know the partisanship of the officials. So again, thank you so much and apologies for the technical difficulties there at the beginning. Great, thank you, Laurel. Um... Next up, we have a presentation um, from Rebecca Wagner of the Peace Research Institute on the ambiguity of international electoral aid for electoral resilience of CSOs during processes of democratic backsliding. Okay, I guess now you can hear me as well, and I hope you can all see my presentation so very well. Um, yeah, um, thank you very much for being able to present today uh, what is part of my PhD research. Um, I'm not directly looking at election um, or electoral officials, but more on the electoral environment. Nonetheless, um, I think it's um, in the same um, important to understand what is happening. And there, in particularly, um, I'm looking at the effects of international electoral aid um, and whether it actually helps civil society organizations to respond to autocratization processes um, as being one of the kind of democratic actors on the ground. Um, so let me just. So, okay, I'm placing my, this research within a broader mid-range theory contributions within the field of autocratization and democratic uh, or democracy um, studies that on the one hand, if you look at the recent contributions on the third wave of autocratization, they all argue um, that elections are an important puzzle in the uh, process. However, then when it comes to the details and also to the effects of international electoral aid, um, it remains somehow inconclusive about what kind of effect it actually has. Some say there are some effects, you, uh, some say, okay, there are, like when you have, for, for example, international election observers um, articulating critical comments on the electoral outcome that it increases the likelihood for boycotts or for protests, etc. So there's different kind of research on the elections. Um, however, what we are still a bit missing also within this field is 
Um, what is actually the research on the impact of civil society organizations within this complex dynamic, domestic dynamics of um, autocratization processes? And there are some studies that actually argue that um, international donor practices do more reinforce autocratization processes and that they actually rather contribute to shrinking civic space in the same way as, for example, domestic governments um, to um, implement restrictions on um, citizen um, organizations, on civil society organizations. So in that sense, I'm also expecting um, for my research that um, as regards to the impact on the capacities of civil society organizations to respond to um, autocratization process and processes and electoral restrictions, that is more like um, ambivalent in that sense. Um, what I'm doing theoretically, so in order to kind of understand what are the capacities of these organizations, they have to respond somehow to some kind of risks. The risks are shrinking civic space, um, those are electoral manipulations and malpractices that are targeting the electoral environment and then there are different forms of how these organizations um, can respond to that for example um, they can continue to implement um, domestic election observation missions or build um, electoral um, alliances and coalitions but they can also for example reduce the size of a domestic election observation mission that would be then more an adaptation um, to to the um, new environment and then they, they could also stop their work leave the country or also close down their offices which would be maybe rather a resignation to the new context um so and depending on how they react um i'm saying okay you can also measure or you can assume that there's a certain level of resilience present um among those um organizations that is either high medium or low um, and in that sense, electoral resilience is understood then as their capacity to, to withstand, adapt, or to recover to election related restrictions. Um, so, what I'm doing is um, I use a case study analysis um, of the case of Kyrgyzstan. Um, and for that, it is a crucial case study um, where you have competitive elections, you have a vivid civil society um, sector, and you have um, also um, uh, plenty full of international um, electoral um, support to the country since um, the independence um, and methodologically. Um, I used like the OECE or DEAR election observation reports, but then also primary and secondary resources, as well as um, during my field research, I conducted interviews with CSO representatives and also I conducted group discussions. So it's a qualitative research. Um, and uh, what I can say about, and of course it's, um, and it's just a glimpse of the current research that I can present now. Um, you see among, especially when you look on the electoral processes, you do see different phases within um, the last 30 years in the country. You also see that um, citizen election observers and civil society that were somehow involved in the electoral process, they reacted mainly by using resistance strategies. Um, around the electoral um like around elections for example um through building coalitions but also mobilizing around elections um there were several ngo laws that were successfully frustrated during the last 15 years in kyrgyzstan starting with 2001 um however the last one is now recently on debate again and we still don't know how the outcome will be but um the last successful frustration of an um, ngo law that was a draft law from the russian foreign agent law was between 2013 2016. Uh, however then also recently you see that the civil society sector and also the citizen election observers seem to be more um 
how you can say burnt out, maybe they are weaker. Um, you see less mobilization around um, important topics. You have since um, 2020, 20, with the Chaparov government, you had several processes ongoing and an open um, ongoing um, autocratization process um, where you didn't see so much um, of mobilization against that. And the question is also why. Um, so part of what I'm looking on is what are the effects of the international aid on that? Um, so you can say on the one hand that the um, international financial support to the civic society sector was immense and without the support the sector would actually not exist in that sense as it's existing um, especially if you look at um, like the NGO sector in that sense that is really organized established um, NGOs um, but there's also a lot of domestic criticism towards it, that they say, okay, it's a more like neoliberal approach, that it's a Western perspective on civil society organizations, um, that they do not have like really voluntary structures, um, and that there is no philan philanthropy behind it, but then they're also kind of lacking their constituencies. Um, furthermore, um, the sector remains donor dependent um, with a lack of sufficient alternative resources and then also due to the reduction of foreign aid, um, the sector started to struggle. So at the same time, what also happened domestically that you can see that there was a challenge to the international normative framework. Um, you um, had especially since 2010 where they had this kind of revolution again and it seems like that there was a democratic revival um, with the election of Atambayev in 2011 it started that they more openly challenged international organizations it came along um, with the closure of the US military air base and also with uh, a non signing of an agreement bilateral aid agreement again with the us um, it came also along with the downgrading of the oece center in bishkek to a program office what meant that also the oec had less competences in deciding what they are doing and the government had more a say on um, their programs and also what um, kind of on their direction um, and it seemed also long that the donor side adapted to this um, domestic challenges that they worked more um, with government agencies and less with civil society organizations. Um, so, and you can see this also very well in the case of the citizen election observer sector. Um, and I did this case study based on the coalition of democracy and human rights, which which was one of the kind of most important human rights and democracy organizations in the country. And it received um, also heavily support from especially NDI, but then also USAID. Um, and for sure, you can say that um, this organization and also this, the scene of domestic election obser observation would have not existed without the support. Um, from the US democracy and human rights programs. The, the positive thing about also the coalition was that it emerged out of a forum of NGOs, of different NGOs in the um, country. And so it was a kind of countrywide um, alliance. Um, also, NDI did regard um, the coalition as one of their kind of greatest achievements in the way they are supported the organization. So you can also say that they received a lot of financial and also ideational um, support. And what was maybe good with the coalition in comparison with other NGOs is that they were able to establish um, kind of formal electoral network in the regions nationally, but also internationally, also through the way election observation is organized on a global level, that there's a certain diffusion of um, electoral standards as well, um, that they established an electoral expertise and they had some kind of sustainability in their structure. So there was kind of um, a transition from one head to another head. But then on the same time, also they constantly um, were challenged domestically as soon as they got established and they also received um, 
challenges um, in different ways, personal threats, harassment, uh, stigmatization, um, um, defamation campaigns against the leaders personally, but also against the organization, against election observers on election day. Um, and then what you can see um, as well is that since 2010-11, when Atambayev um, started to challenge the organization that continued with Chen Bekov, that also the way of how the electoral field was manipulated changed slightly again. Um, there was uh, like during the field research, they reported, for example, about a case that an, um, an government agent was infiltrated in the organization that also was part of the dissolution or kind of part of the weakening of the organization. But of course, also you can then um, question at the end also how sustainable were the structures, but then also due to the reduction of the foreign aid and the financial support, there was more competition in the field. Um, less funding available, so the structures eroded also in the regions and um, the kind of mobilization cap cap capacity started to erode. Um, I think I'm kind of over already with my time. So um, what I can just say from this very brief glimpse on the case study is that you can say for sure that international electoral aid both strengthens and weakens the civic sector. It has an immense impact on the domestic election observation scene. However, also when they retrain and when there are no sustainable or kind of other alternative funding mechanisms that are often in this kind of cases and countries um, are not available, then it also has an impact on the sustainability and weakens those organizations. Um, then there's also this competition over grant that uh, reduces the trust and um, also the, uh, like, uh, has um, impact on the resources. And um, you can also say that um, the domestic challenges on the international normative framework had domestically the impact that on the one hand, elections got maybe cleaner. The management of the elections was better conducted on election day in particularly. Doesn't mean that there are no fraud. I'm not saying that, but in general, election day went quite well, especially if you think about Chaparov, the last elections went quite smooth on election day. However, then um, the eroding of the sector is done in another way and it's more incremental and more um, um, diff challenging to Perhaps in that sense. So, yeah, thank you very much. And I'm very much looking forward to your comments and questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, next up, we have Ani Tepnadze presenting uh, research along with Eric Karen of West Virginia University, evaluating the partisan effects of pandemic mitigation with polling place data from the Republic of Georgia. Yeah, just a second. Hmm. Okay, can everybody see my presentation? Yep. Yep, okay, great. So let me start this. All right, um, so so the presentation um, we will be um, we will be presenting me and Professor Harden today is about um, elevating the partisan effects of pandemic mitigation with polling place data from the Republic of Georgia. Um, the the research question we are striving to respond in this presentation is um, um, is how. Um, how did the use of mobile polling, uh, polling stations affect behavior in Georgia? And what I mean by that is that um, we, um, we are particularly concerned um, trying to research how the special tool for the pandemic that would allow, allow uh, infected voters to uh, vote at polling places um, at their bedside, um, what was its impact on the voter behavior? What were the results for the um, major party, Georgian Dream, and other political parties? Uh, before I start my presentation um, and particularly move to the research question, um, 
we decided that it was important for you, for those of you who are not very familiar with Georgia and its politics and history to give you a brief introduction. Um, there are a few highlights that are in important to interpreting our results so that you have a sense of the of the current events in Georgia. Uh, so first of all, Georgia has in, experienced three periods of crisis and proper transition. The first one dates back to the Declaration of Independence from the Soviet Union in 1981 by Zviet Gamsakurdi and his party round table. Um, he was swiftly replaced by Edward Shevardnadze. It was pushed. It was overthrowing the legally elected president. In, between 1992 and 2003, President Shevardnadze was in power. That was semi-authoritarian rule. In 2003-2004, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the Rose Revolution. That was a peaceful revolution. Um, with no casualties uh, that replaced President's, uh, President Shevardnadze's government. Um, and we started to become this young democracy um, headed by Mikhail Saakashvili. Um, his governance lasted until 2012. And in 2012, we, we, we got the third party dominance uh, by Bidzina Ivanishvili and his newly formed Georgian Dream, which secured a landslide victory in the parliamentary elections. So as we approach the 2020 elections in Georgia, again, parliamentarian elections, um, parliamentary elections, there were two challenges that the Georgian Central Electoral Commission was facing. So the first one was conducting elections at the occupied territories, um, which you um, probably, a lot of you know that 20% of Georgian territories are occupied by Russia. This conflict is still um, ongoing, kind of um, crawling uh, occupation continues. So Georgian Electoral Commission oftentimes during the elections faces the challenge of conducting elections in the, um, in the you know, conflict areas. But today we're not going to focus on that. We are focusing on the challenge that was stipulated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we focus on how raising COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, October, um, how it affected the uh, elections, uh, the whole process of registering voters and um, counting votes, and generally the process, the day. Usually during regular elections, Georgians usually go to the polling places um, that are located in their districts. We've got four, 84 electoral districts and 3,800 polling stations. Georgia uses a mixed member majoritarian electoral system. Uh, we elect 150 members of the parliament, 120 via um, party list proportional representation, and only 30 with majoritarian runoff. Um, it's important to note that because 120 members of the parliament are elected via party list proportional representation, it kind of holds more weight and um, some of the puzzles that we used as our research question is focusing on this party list votes, even though we are presenting the holistic picture of both rounds of the elections. Um, as I mentioned, um, I'm not sure if I mentioned, uh, in 2020, we've got, we had two rounds of competition. The first round um, was on October 31st, and the second round was on November 21st. Um, the first round of competitions, uh, in the first round of the competition, the voters voted for two ballots. And in the second round, only uh, the runoff was held only in several uh, majoritarian constituencies. Um, so the Georgian Dream, the ruling party in the first round of the election, secured 48% of the proportional representation votes. That was approximately 60 seats, so half of the uh, PR component. Um, and this, uh, and in the majoritarian round, it's it secured 13 out of 30 seats. So it's important to note that. Um, even though voters vote at the um, polling place for two ballots, some in some ways that is kind of um, um, nebulous to us, even at this point. We don't know why Georgian Dream performed so well in peer component, but not in the majoritarian. So um, the second round was held um, because um, 
only 13 constituencies out of 30 secured 50 50 point uh, 50 percent plus fund votes and um what we are looking at in this research is the Georgian dream performance at the standard regular polling places and mobile polling places. We analyze the administration of the elections and the consequences, how outcomes in polling places created specifically for the quarantined voters differ, differed from the standard polling places. Um, yeah, this is our research question. Um, here's the empirical puzzle, which will be, uh, which is more visual, and you can see um, that this figure one um, displays the mean proportion of the PC level vote that Georgian Dream received in each of the 30 constituencies in, in the 2016 and 2020 parliamentary elections. We, we um, decided to visualize 2016 elections because we are trying to show the trend, how they usually perform at the regular polling place. The 2016 elections are represented by green markers. Um, the 2020 elections are represented by blue markers, but these are only standard pieces. And the red markers are mobile pieces, the so-called emergency polling stations where COVID-infected voters participated. While the Georgian Dream performance varies between 2016 and 2020, the difference in performance at the district level are not generally large. We see that gr uh, green and blue markers are pretty close to each other. However, in most district Georgian Dream's performance in mobile mobile polling stations substantially exceeds its performance in standard polling places. Um, we see that the um, the proportion, mean proportion of the vote um, is um, denoted in the mobile polling places with red markers. They are, um, you know, um, at least several percentage points up from the blue and green markers. Um, Professor Heron and I came up with four potential explanations to why Georgian Dream significantly outperformed um, in mobile polling places to standard polling places. So the first explanation we came up with was selection effects of voters. Um, second one is partisanship and election administration. The third one is location of special polling places. And the fourth one is fraud or intimidation. This last part for fraud or intimidation has several parts to it. But as I, um, as I continue, I will introduce to all of them in more detail. So selection effects and um, staff partisanship at mobile ballot places. Um, what selection effect means that if you remember the US elections, I think that we all clearly remember that particular party supporters were associated with following the government guidelines and voting either via mail-in ballot or going to polling stations, no matter what the threat was for them, right? So we decided that maybe um, Georgian Dream supporters were um, particularly, um, they were more likely to be infected people because they were not, um, they were following the government guidelines. So they were located at the um, COVID hospitals. So the, therefore, the first hypothesis is that majority of the COVID infected people in the hospitals were Georgian Dream supporters. To test our first hypothesis, we conducted and analyzed a survey of a nationally representative sample from Georgia. We asked a few questions that could potentially help us to identify whether Georgian Dream supporters were more or less vulnerable to get infected and as a result end up voting at emergency polling places. What we find out is that Georgian Dream supporters are more likely than less likely to pay attention to news about pandemic and trust government's precautionary measures to engage in disease mitigation behavior, and they are less likely than other voters to believe false narratives or fear economic costs of staying at home. Um, so Georgian Dream supporters are not really likely to be overrepresented among the infected voters based on this survey. The second hypothesis we tested was that staff partisanship. I know Daniel already mentioned in his uh, presentation that um, partisanship of the polling station voters can have potential impact on the um, outcome. Uh, of political parties, we tried to test this. So the thing is that if you look at the distribution of the polling place staffers, Georgian Dream appointed 
them predominantly everywhere. They did not appoint their um, party supporters only at the mobile ballot places, everywhere at both standard and mobile ballot places, Georgian Dream supporters were the majority of the staffers at the polling places. So this also cannot explain why Georgian Dream performed better. Um, um, location of the special polling places. So the next potential explanation was that what if the polling places, special polling places were just located at the strongholds? So what we did was that we geolocated each and every um, each and every mobile ballot place, all 3,800, um, and we created neighborhoods, three kilometers, five kilometers, 10 kilometers neighborhoods, and we did difference of means tests. And the map shows results of our analysis. We see that green markers denote polling places where Georgian Dream performed better in mobile pieces than in standard pieces. What if, if they did not perform better and if, if their outcome, um, was not differentiable between mobile and standard places, we have to see predominantly purple markers. Um, if their places, if their, if the mobile ballot places were not located at their strongholds, there should be a um, majority of this um, map should show purple markers. And the red markers denote, oh, sorry. And the red markers denote where Georgian Dream um, performed worse in mobile ballot places, uh, mobile polling places than in standard, standard ones. And we see there are only very few of them. Um, so we have to mention that for, for the purpose of difference of mean test, um, this circle and triangle uh, differentiate those mobile ballot places where we had analytical issues. So what we mean by analytical issues that um, sometimes because mobile ballot places were so few, we didn't have the whole um, large, large enough sample size to have the test statistically significant. Our last explanation is fraud or intimidation. Um, we considered invalid ballot numbers, rates, last digit forensics, and turnout. Um, so what I want to mention here is that um, the invalid ballot rates, um, some people make mistakes and we thought, what if, um, you know, what is the percentage of inval invalid ballot rates? We see that percentage of invalid rates are um, less, less. Um, at mobile ballot places and mobile polling places than at standard polling places. But the potential explanation is that at um, emergency places, each voter has uh, people that are helping them to vote. I think I'm running out of time, so I want to be really um, brief so that I finalize my presentation. I'm sorry for time mismanagement. Last digit forensics is um, trying to see if some numbers are used more than others. We would try to see if there was a, uh, if there was a chance of kind of rounding up the um, ra rounding up the votes for the benefit of the of the Georgian Dream. Um, we didn't see um, particularly many zeros and fives in the performance of Georgian Dream. And our last explanation is the turnout. Um, we tried to see if the turnout was particularly high at um, mobile ballot place, mobile uh, polling places, um, especially when the turnout is high with the party performance. It gives the sign. Uh, it gives the researchers some sort of understanding whether there was um, large scale fraud going on. Here we are presenting it. We, ha if there was a um, systematic fraud going on, we have to see the clustered data of turnout and high party performance here in the right top um, part. Um, but we don't really see that. So um, to finalize our analysis, we just want to say that Georgian Rim did particularly well at the emergency polling places. Um, we could not really determine there was systematic fraud going on, but there is a chance that voters were associating their care, free care in hospitals with the Georgian dream, with the ruling party. And there was also a chance that some cues were given to the voters, um, you know, some, some sort of intimidation. Um, 
we want to also emphasize that we conducted some local and international researchers and observation teams and asked them if there was systematic observation going on at the mobile ballot mobile polling places. Um, and they said they were not attending um, these places because of the fear of getting infected. Um, so this raises some more questions. What was going on um, at the polling places where there were only the bad side voters and the uh, people, polling station workers that were predominantly appointed by the Georgian Dream ruling party. So um, I'm here, glad to hear your comments, questions. Um, please, um, thank you very much for listening. Great, thank you very much, Ani. Mm -hmm. uh, our final presentation is uh, Mara Sutman Lee of Connecticut College on elected election officials as trusted messengers. Uh, take it away, Mara. All right. Uh, can folks see my screen? Yes. Assuming. Okay, great. Um, uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really uh, happy to be here to share this work that I'm doing with Leah Maravaki of Mississippi State University and Rachel Ore at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, this work is funded by the MIT Election Data and Science Lab Evolving Election Administration Grant. Um, we sort of super merged our research teams together um, and have had a lot of fun putting together the research. So I'm excited to share it with everyone. Um, so uh, we are thinking about this work that we are doing here from the perspective of um, some pretty classic public opinion research. Um, we're trying to understand whether election officials in the United States in particular, um, if they are operating as opinion and information leaders. Um, and so this is a part of a broader research agenda that I um, have with Leah Maravaki, where we're really trying to capture, measure, assess, um, the voter education and outreach efforts of local election officials uh, and state election officials as well. Um, this is sort of this area of work where there has not been a ton of research. Um, there's not a lot of data on what these folks actually say to their constituents. And so this is a part of those efforts. Um, so we're thinking about election officials as one, information leaders. Um, how can I help voters be hashtag election ready? How can I make sure that they get the right information that is needed to register, find their polling place, cast their mail ballot, make sure their ballot counts. But we're also thinking about them as in opinion leaders. Um, are um, election officials effectively operating in such a way that helps voters have greater confidence in ballot accuracy um, in their state? Um, so to give a little bit of background on the work that Leah and I have done on voter education, um, we now fortunately have a series um, of papers that have established that voter education by election officials can help improve voters' actual experiences. We know that where election officials are more active in their outreach efforts, that voters are more likely to successfully complete processes. They're more likely to cast mail ballots that don't get rejected. They're more likely to successfully fill out registration uh, forms. Um, and uh, fortunately, um, you know, we also know that this helps them become resilient against mis and disinformation. Um, we think that there's some sort of like an inoculative effect that's happening here. Um, we also know, however, that voters are more connected with election officials close to home. Uh, and by that, I mean your local election officials, your county clerks, your registrars. Uh, and this work is trying to understand whether state election officials, the folks who are more visible, who are more out there, um, the folks who are making headlines in some cases during election cycles, um, if they can have a, develop a similar relationship with their voters. Um, so yes, this question, can trust building campaigns bolster state level confident? Um, folks might be familiar with, some folks in the room might be familiar with um, that there has been since 2019, a concerted trust building effort, a concerted coordinated consistently repeated over time trust building effort that has been um, generated by election officials across the United States. Um, it's known as the hashtag trusted info cam uh, campaign, um, but there are also other ways in which election officials are trying to build trust among their voters. Um, so this brings us to this question, has this campaign actually worked? Is there at least a relationship that we can see both with election officials motivating voters to look to them for sources as sources of information about how to vote and also their confidence in um, ballot counting and election outcomes? 
So something that we know from established research is that statewide voter confidence is consistently lower compared to voter confidence at the personal or the local level. And this is, again, because of that close to home phenomenon. Voters tend to be more um, confident and trustworthy of things that they can see, things that are actually closer to home, election officials that they might be more familiar with. Um, we also do, do have some evidence um, that consistent communication from state election officials can insulate against integrity concerns. Um, so voters that live where their state election officials are consistently communicating with them are more likely to have confidence in um, ballot counting, at least at the personal, local, and state level. Um, so we're thinking here more specifically in this project, you know, moving beyond just measures of consistency and communication and looking at are these specific trust building campaigns actually working. Um, but again, I want to highlight voters are more disconnected from state election officials as sources of election information. Um, and we also have to contend with the fact that we have election deniers that are magnifying concerns about the integrity of elections. And these folks are also often running against these state election officials. Um, so there's a lot of different moving pieces here. So we do think that election officials can operate as effective information and opinion leaders through consistent long-term trust building campaigns. So this hashtag trusted info campaign is a really great chance to um, sort of assess whether or not this is there's a relationship there. Um, and I have here uh, just an example from um, one of uh, the secretaries of, or the secretary of state from the state of Kentucky, um, who really does sort of from our own observations do an incredible job of communicating with his voters. Um, you know, here he says, you know, he's going to be talking on the news about preparation for November's election on May 16th of last year. Um, he responded to a voter is looking to try to understand how to can cancel absentee ballots um, and instead voting in person. Um, and so, you know, this is the kind of um, communication that we're trying to measure and understand and see if there's actually an impact. Um, so a little bit more about our theoretical expectations. Um, we think that state election officials can serve as information leaders, specifically driving voters to them or local election officials as sources of election information. Um, this uh, consistent long-term trust building campaign, um, we think, we hope, will motivate voters to look to them as sources of trusted information. And of course, these election officials are the ones that are most likely to have the accurate information information about what is needed to cast a ballot. We also expect that state election officials can serve as opinion leaders. Um, again, they've been over the past couple of years a part of this uh, long-term campaign to communicate to voters that election processes in their state are safe and secure. Um, these campaigns, um, we hope, help voters identify their state election official as an authority, and so we expect that voters will express higher confidence in statewide ballot accuracy where election officials are more consistently engaged in these trust building efforts. Um, so a little bit about our variables and our research design. I'm happy to answer more in the Q&A. Um, we are, again, looking at two um, different or two related questions here. One, can trust building efforts help voters um, or motivate voters to look to state election officials as a source of information. And we are getting these data from a survey that was conducted by the Bipartisan Policy Center um, trying to assess sources of voter information. We also have um, two different confidence dependent variables, one that is a pre-election assessment of confidence in ballot counting at the state level, and one that is the post-election assessment of ballot counting at the state level. Uh, and then our independent variable, our trust building messages uh, shared on social media, um, specifically Facebook during the 2022 election cycle. And so for these data, um, we coded uh, the total for all state and local election officials is something like 50,000 unique posts. State election officials is obviously somewhat lower, um, but it was a lot of coding that we went through um, to establish these trust building messages and measures, and I'm happy to talk more about what those look like um, in the Q&A. Um, so we've constructed this social 2022 social media data set. We have a pre-election survey from the Bipartisan Policy Center that gives us information on where voters are looking for um, information about how to vote, as well as pre-election measures of confidence. And then we also have merged all of this with the Survey of the Performance of American Elections, um, their, their annual post-election survey um, that gets measures of voter confidence in the post-election period. Um, and so we're testing information-seeking behavior with the pre-election survey, statewide confidence with the pre and post election surveys and we've constructed these trust building measures. 
So a little bit more detail about what these look like. Um, we have measures that look at the proportion of content shared that use specifically the hashtag trusted info 2022 um, campaign, the proportion of content shared that included trust building measures. And so these included um, posts that had terms like trust, safe, secure, trusted. Uh, and then we also have a measure of whether or not states explicitly took this hashtag trusted info pledge in 2022 and 2020. So here we have visualized, um, and it's a little bit small, I apologize, um, just sort of what some of the variation in content sharing looks like. So the blue line here is non-trust building content um, that is being shared. The gray bar is um, content that includes that hashtag trusted info. And then the darker gray bar is um, the content that includes um, other trust building measures. And so we can see, you know, a place like Arizona, maybe not surprisingly, um, about 47% of the content that they shared on their um, Facebook account during the 2022 cycle was um, using that hashtag trusted info uh, 2022 um, measure. So I'm gonna um, give a really quick and dirty rundown of our top line findings. And again, I'm happy to go into more detail in the Q&A. Um, so what we are looking at here is um, uh, whether or not these trust building measures can motivate voters to uh, look to their election official as um, at least one of their top three sources of information on how to register and vote. Um, and so, Actually, not super surprisingly, and I'm happy to talk about this more, um, there is a negative relationship between taking this hashtag trusted info 2022 pledge and voters looking to state election officials um, for information about how to register and vote. Um, we do see a positive relationship between um, the use of the hashtag as well as other trust building measures, but we see that there are these two negative um, relationships here. Uh, and so I, I have many thoughts on, on why that might be the case. Um, so in uh, this figure, we're looking at um, pre-election and post-election confidence in ballot accuracy. Um, another not so surprising finding um, that I'm happy to talk more about, um, just given some other work that I have out there, the selecting your state election official as a top, as a, one of your top information sources for information about how to vote has a negative relationship with confidence in ballot accuracy pre-election. Um, and then we see the similar relationship with this um, hashtag trusted info um, variable in the post-election confidence measure. Um, although here it is specifically the proportion of posts that include this hashtag um, that have this negative relationship. Um, uh, but then fortunately, um, there is a positive relationship between trust building posts, so posts that don't necessarily use that hashtag campaign, um, and um, confidence in ballot accuracy uh, uh, in the um, post-election period. Um, so, Big picture next steps. Um, these are relationships. Um, you know, we know it's important to engage in um, sort of a more precise causal assessment of voter engagement with and reaction to these messages. Um, folks, um, there are folks down at Auburn University who actually have some great experiments that they've done um, specifically assessing um, these dynamics and they have found similar things, um, which is sort of like mixed, mixed results there. Um, some evidence that trust building messages can bolster confidence, but um, there's there's not a whole lot of hope for that hashtag campaign, unfortunately. Um, we're also, of course, going to be looking to other modes of voter education. Um, so we have used their content, state election official content shared on social media, because nearly every state election official has an active social media account on Facebook. Um, and so we can sort of get this, this wide um, variation in what content looks like and what's shared. Um, but we also know that there's a lot of other things that they do, and we want to figure out the extent to which this is a proxy for other activity. Um, and then we'll be going through invalidating um, our coding and our text searches, and um, we do fortunately have the infrastructure to replicate this project in 2024 and then hopefully 2026 and beyond. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I hope I didn't take up too much time, uh, and I look forward to your questions and comments.